the U.S. has some of the greatest universities and colleges in the world, attracting countless students from all over the globe, influencing worldwide academia with respect to everything from pedagogy and research to academic culture. And this is why it's so important for these institutions to maintain their integrity as safe havens for free and open discourse. And unfortunately, so many of our campuses have experienced shifts, especially recently, that threaten open intellectual debate and the idea of having a free marketplace of ideas in plenty of ways over the last decade or so and even more noticeably in the past year or two we've seen unprecedented levels of emotional hypersensitivity political correctness enforcement and suppression of controversial views on campuses here and elsewhere in the western world Political correctness and zealotry are nothing new in academia and among college students, but certainly the university atmosphere has become more a place of ideological supremacy and political hysteria in different aspects with new emergences of safe spaces, trigger warnings and censorship. Sometimes, you know, there are folks on college campuses who are liberal and maybe even agree with me on a bunch of issues who sometimes aren't listening to the other side. I've heard some college campuses where they don't want to have a guest speaker who, you know, is too conservative. You know, I, I don't agree that you, when you become students at colleges, have to be coddled and protected from different points of view. Language on campus is often being policed to the point of delirium. There's a new reinforced touchiness about microaggressions and cultural appropriations, and it's now more taboo than ever to discuss or even acknowledge Islam's relationship with extremism or express opinions that are affirmative of Israel. Radical feminists at a new rate are appealing to onslaughts and censorship to protect their ideas and safe spaces providing shelter for all of this are being sanctioned to completely irrational lengths by students and universities. It's worth mentioning that on environments like college campuses where young people are in the process of forming political orientations, this is also terrible PR for liberalism itself. Taking political correctness to these extremes is misleading students into thinking that this is what being progressive is all about. It's causing them to throw out liberalism altogether when they observe how some progressives are just defying common sense. I agree with that. Then, then why the f did you accept the position? Because Who I the f hired you. Progressivism is no doubt crucial to the advancement of society, and I mean it with the utmost sincerity when I say that what I'm describing about college campuses can only be a disservice to the long term survival of the progressive movement. The uh, elements of the left that are regressive are enforcing their agendas to a point of diminishing return. Let's look at just a few examples only from the past couple of years. In 2015, the University of New Hampshire issued an official memo to its student body called the Bias Free Language Guide, which encouraged all students to avoid using certain words, including homosexual, senior citizen, overweight, speech impediment, sexual preference, manpower, freshman, mailman, chairman, and dumb. Pretty dumb. Of course, the phasing out of things like racial and sexual epithets over the 20th century has been an important and hugely positive change. But this type of over the top political correctness is categorically authoritarian and to a whole new degree. And I seriously doubt that it serves any actual productive purpose. There's certainly nothing liberal about policing people's language to this extreme. In April of last year, an event was held by a residence building at the University of California, Santa Cruz, for students to come have dinner and socialize. And organizers provided a burrito buffet for the students. Each of these events that they hold has a different theme with different decorations. And this time, the theme happened to be outer space and science fiction with decorations that included things like spaceships and aliens.
UCSC ended up publicly apologizing on behalf of the events organizers about the food that was served because there were some people who perceived that the matchup burritos and outer space to be a suggestion that Mexican food is strange or outlandish. And organizers earnestly insisted that there was no connection whatsoever between the food and the outer space theme. But program staff were nevertheless reprimanded and required to attend cultural sensitivity training. The movement to reduce transgender stigma recently has been a wonderful thing, and I'm a huge supporter. I support things like the boycotting of states that discriminate against transgender people and the transgender rights movement still definitely has its work cut out. But political correctness around some corners of this issue has also gotten out of hand. Last year, Mount Holyoke College, a school in Massachusetts, had been planning to put on a production of the Vagina Monologues, a well-known and really frequently performed feminist play. But soon thereafter, the college announced that they were going to cancel the play, claiming that the title, The Vagina Monologues, was disrespectful to transgender women without vaginas. The school issued a public apology for even considering to put on the play, explaining that the title of the play failed to affirm transgender women who don't have vaginas. And we are mindful that exclusion from the category of woman based on contingent properties of birth is nothing new. Last summer at UCLA, a student wrote an article in the school newspaper arguing that low income women in the U.S. should be provided with better access to tampons and that this would be a big step in the right direction for gender equality in healthcare. Makes sense. The student was forced to publicly apologize and amend her article after backlash that accused her of implying that menstruation is a women's issue. The online newspaper was also compelled to go back and add disclaimers at the top of the article to appease those who had a problem with it. Feminism, another domain where we see some overbearing political correctness and censorship on campuses. Laura Kipnis is a professor at Northwestern who teaches on topics related to communications, feminism and gender relations. And in February of 2015, she wrote an essay in the Chronicle of Higher Education where she mainly critiqued the attitudes and tactics of fanatical regressive feminists, saying that modern radical feminism has actually infantilized women in many ways and has undone decades of productive feminism. Ironically, in response to her article, there was widespread distraught backlash and protest against her at Northwestern and two feminist students simultaneously filed Title IX complaints against her. The two students brought the charges on the grounds that her article supposedly retaliated against victims of sexual harassment at Northwestern. One of the students charges was against Kipnis's article itself and the charge filed by the other student was actually specifically in regard to Kipnis's Twitter feed, referencing tweets that she had written about the same topic. Both charges were completely unprecedented in their nature. So when I found out, I got this letter from the Title IX office that the complaints had been filed against me. I, under you know Title IX, and I like everyone else thought, well, doesn't this have to do with like gender discrimination or sexual harassment? I wasn't that familiar with it, and I didn't see how it could apply to an article. And I was being charged with retaliation, and I didn't see how I could be charged with retaliation if I hadn't committed some sexual misconduct against somebody in the first place that I'd been charged with. So the whole thing was very baffling. During the investigation, in accordance with Title IX, Kipnis was not allowed to have an attorney or talk about the investigation to anyone, nor was she even informed of the charges before her first interrogation. The investigation came within an inch of costing Kipnis her tenure and career, and investigators only agreed to drop the case upon the conditions that Kipnis would no longer write things like it and that she would publicly apologize for the situation. This is just one of many examples where universities stifle and punish professors for doing what academics are supposed to do, positing philosophical arguments regarding important issues, some of which are going to be dissident and controversial from time to time, 
what use is a university that not only doesn't allow this to happen, but actually punishes scholars for participating in totally legitimate debates about ethics? Islam is another topic where we see this form of authoritarian so-called liberalism on campuses. In November of 2015 at the University of California, Merced, a Muslim student went on a stabbing spree, seriously injuring four people. Afterwards, a federal investigation determined that the students acts of violence were explicitly inspired by Islam and Jihad, finding an ISIS flag in the student's room, as well as a two page jihadist manifesto in his pocket at the time of the stabbings, which specifically outlined the link between the attacks and his Islamic extremism. Following the attack, UC Merced went to great systematic lengths to convince the public and the campus community that the acts were not at all inspired by Islam. And in this effort, the school had seminars about Islamophobia and advocated that the attacks had little to do with religious extremism and were instead a result of masculinity and sexist patriarchy. There is a massive and undeniable tendency in American higher education to whitewash the harmfulness of Islamism because of people's perception of Muslims as an oppressed group, as well as to vilify Israel and Jews who were often falsely considered not to be a marginalized minority people in spite of being one of the most historically oppressed groups in the world. Not to mention that Jews make up about 0.2% of the world's population and have been massacred and expelled from their homelands literally countless times throughout history from the original exile of the Israelites to hundreds of years of enslavement and dispersion in the Roman Empire to, of course, the Holocaust. Earlier this year at UC Berkeley, a top American public school, the most recent meeting of an organization called the Students of Color Conference, made itself an anti-Jewish safe space by openly systematizing its anti-Israeli positions while aggressively ridiculing its Jewish members for not unconditionally denouncing Israel. And in 2014, the student Senate president at Ohio University created an official blood bucket challenge campaign, a sort of parody of the ALS ice bucket challenge as a sentiment against Israel. Months later at Goldsmiths University of London in the United Kingdom, the student government voted almost unanimously against a university Holocaust commemoration because they considered it to be too Eurocentrist and colonialist. And finally, I'd like to close with an example that made headlines at the end of 2015, which really perfectly illustrates so much of what is wrong with safe spaces and regressive authoritarianism at U.S. universities. In November of 2015 at the University of Missouri, students rightfully pressured University President Tim Wolf to resign from his post after months of school wide racial tensions and protests. But here's where things get weird. Then immediately following Wolf's resignation, a group of student activists held a celebratory rally on campus where they set up a campsite and occupied a large area on outdoor public university property. The students who participated in this event took it upon themselves to declare the area a safe space for their cause, and they hostilely enforced it as such. Tim Tai is an Asian American student at Missouri. He was assaulted for even trying to photograph the event. The rally goers had absolutely no legal right to privacy whatsoever, and Tai was well within his rights to photograph and move around freely. The students who harassed and restrained him were explicit about their motivations of barring any documentation of the rally. The student group who organized the event said the next day on Twitter, it's typically white media who don't understand the importance of respecting black spaces. And if you have a problem with us wanting to have our spaces that we create respected, leave. These tweets were later deleted. During the event, a University of Missouri communications professor, Melissa Click, a journalism instructor, no less, believe it or not, 
also participated in the censorship and intimidation of student reporters. She even threatened them with physical violence. It's simply mind blowing that someone who teaches journalism would sacrifice her values to enforce a safe space in this way. Hey, can I talk to you? No, you need no. to get out. Cool. You need to get out. No, I don't. You need to get out. I actually don't. All right. Hey, who wants to help me get this reporter out of here? I need some muscle over here. Help me get him out. Do you need to get out? You need to get out. This is public property. And yeah, I know that's a really good one. I'm a communication faculty and I really get that argument, but you need to go. Historically, the fundamental concept of having safe spaces has been positive and productive. In no way am I criticizing per se the idea of having private designated physical spaces on campuses or at places of business where people know that they will be free from bigotry. For instance, the LGBT community has undoubtedly faced many struggles trying to acquire rights in recent history. And when a college professor does something like put a rainbow decal on his or her office door, indicating this is an LGBT friendly, safe space, there is nothing there to condemn. But what we should be questioning is when places of higher education, environments that exist explicitly to be soil for free discourse, begin creating what they call safe spaces out of communal public areas or even entire campuses in an effort to block certain ideas and scholarship. These problems on campuses seem to largely stem from identity politics. People are caring more about people's identities than their ideas. Postmodernism, which liberals should and theoretically do hold in high regard, is all about the destruction of barriers between ideas. Aggressively imposing one narrative is the opposite of postmodernism. Um, anyway, so yeah, I, I was I was making what I thought was a relatively uncontroversial point, which is that universities should be centers of learning. Yeah. Um, and this was apparently enough to, for the, these feminists to say, this man spews hatred and smear themselves with red blood, assault somebody afterwards. Yeah, just absolutely crazy. I mean, you, American university campuses are nuts. And we have to be willing to admit that there is usually a pretty clear threshold between free thought and actual bigotry. There is a difference between writing an academic paper about violence and jihad and being legitimately bigoted against all Muslims as people. There is a difference between having a scholarly debate about rape culture and rape statistics and being sexist. And like I said, sometimes people's arguments about these issues are going to be flat wrong. But as long as we're actually willing to have a debate and flesh out the controversies intellectually, then a university is serving its purpose as a venue for open and uninhibited discourse. The way to do that is to create a space where a lot of ideas are presented and collide and people are having arguments and people are testing each other's theories and over time people learn from each other because they're getting out of their own narrow point of view and having a broader point of view. The point of a liberal education is to broaden one's horizons and to investigate and analyze different and sometimes bad ideas. Safe spaces, as they've manifested in the ways I've discussed, work to counter this by homogenizing thought. Safe spaces are often used as political tools to silence or delegitimize opposing viewpoints or to avoid difficult topics with the ridiculous pretense that students are benefiting.